Welcome to Proof Live, where booze brands in the right hands. On a quest for the best tipple and toast with the most exciting and respected bottlings. Competing for the 100-point Perfect Score Century Award and the double gold and a spot on the top shelf to be sipped, shaken, stirred, and celebrated. Slide up to the bar with the biggest names in the spirits game as they clink glasses with your hostess, legendary connoisseur Jennifer English, for intimate conversations, live tastings, product launches, and the happiest hour there is. Now broadcasting live from the commodious confines of the Swanky Proof Saloon, where the liquid elite meet. Here is your hostess, the Madam of Manhattans, the Duchess of Daiquiris, the Queen of Conviviality, your hostess, James Beard Award winner, Jennifer English. Well, hello, everybody. I'm Jennifer English, the editor at large of Proof the Magazine and host of Proof Live. I want to tell you that every time we enter the Proof Saloon, I have this fantasy that we are entertaining in the most commodious of rooms. Today, we're actually going to take you to one of the greatest rooms we've ever seen. It's on the it's on the the banks of, uh, of the Russian River in Healdsburg, California. It's just an oasis in which the pleasures of the table where true hospitality and conviviality are born. And as we celebrate the introduction of another Century Award winner, that's a 100-point wine winner in this instance. You may want to know what it is, but we're going to save that for just another minute. You know, the Proof Awards 2020 were extraordinary. And we had we had more exceptional entries than ever before, including gold, double gold, and even Century Award winners. That's a unanimous vote among the judges. 100 points, a perfect score. Well, what wine earned that perfect score? The wine that was born of a dream. The dream was Barefoot Cellars. And the winemaker who produced this extraordinary wine was hired by our next guest, the visionary pioneer, Michael Houlihan joins us now from the greatest room I've ever seen. <laughs> Michael, how are you? Thank you, thank you, and welcome. Look at the space you've created for hosting parties and clinking glasses. My goodness, if I were going to make a movie about the greatest party that ever happened, it would take place in a room that looked very much like that. You know, uh, Bonnie and I were environmental determinists, and you know, when we had Barefoot and we built it, we would bring our distributors here and uh, Jennifer Wall uh, would put on a winemaker dinner for them. And uh, these people came from all over the world. And, you know, they usually go to wine tasting rooms and see barrels and pumps and, you know, vineyards and crush pads. And we would just bring them here and let them run around outside barefoot, you know, on our beautiful estate and enjoy a wonderful meal and enjoy wines and listen to Jennifer here in this room. Michael, the idea for Barefoot, as you just hinted at, is about freedom and ease and conviviality. Would you talk a little bit about the dream before the birth of the company and the wines? There had to have been a dreamy concept. How did that dream get born? Well, you know, Bonnie and I are both urban refugees. And I came from San Francisco and she came from Portland. And in our lifetime, we watched our cities get infilled and we watched the perimeters of our cities get developed. And after a while, you had to drive 50 miles just to get out of town. But there was this wonderful oasis here in Northern California that was just about 90 miles north of San Francisco on the Pacific coast. It's called Sonoma County. And we moved here, not for the wines, but we moved here for the lifestyle. And we moved here independently and we met here. But of course, when you're in the wine industry or anywhere near it, you get sucked into it. It's like a vortex. So, you know, we were both consultants and Bonnie was working for a vineyard uh, owner who was owed $300,000 by a winery that had just declared bankruptcy. 
And I had worked for vineyard owners, helping them subdivide their property and work with the government because that was my background. Well, I went to this winery to try to collect, and the only thing I could get out of them was goods and services. So the goods were bulk wine, Cabernet Sauvignon and Sauvignon Blanc, and the services were bottling services. So in other words, instead of dollars, we got bottled wine. It had no label. You know, it was just bottled wine. So we had to come up with an entire concept for a wine and a winery and a marketing program, a merchandising program, and learn all the laws in the, in the 50 states and everything else. And uh, we were both, you know, like I said, urban refugees. So for us, the idea of being barefoot, whenever we would go on a hike, we'd go on a picnic, we'd take our shoes off, right? And we ever go to the beach, we'd take our shoes off. And so we like this idea of, you know, being relaxed. It's hard to be uptight when you're barefoot, you know. And uh, at the time, this was back in the late 80s, the wine industry was very snobby and uh, very isolationist at that time. You know, you had to know French varietal names. You had to know the appellations. And it wasn't really about enjoying the wine so much as it was kind of browbeating the customer about the wines and you should know more about them. And so we said, well, if we're going to do this, we need to come up with a name and a label and a, a lifestyle that is more of a movement that has the wine to go with it. And so that's what the barefoot spirit is all about. It's about the idea of what do you do when you're in nature? How do you enjoy yourself in a beautiful environment? Uh, how do you enjoy other people? So it's, it's more about the style of life than it is about the procedures for how to make wine and where to grow it and all that stuff. So that, that's, a, that's just a short little summary of the barefoot spirit. Let's talk about the fact that at that time, late 80s, early 90s, the world of wine still had a predisposition to considering American wines in a secondary seat to the great Grand Cru Bordeaux, et cetera. And that was what fine wine, and it was even called fine wine at that time, was all about. Uh, did you know when you were doing this, you were literally creating an entire new category of wine and an entire new industry? Because I just don't think that the wine industry that we have today has anything to do with the wine industry that existed in the 80s and before. No, there's no question that Barefoot built a lot of bridges and expanded the wine aficionado envelope. And the way it did was by being non-intimidated, in intimidating, it was affordable, it was approachable, and it was accessible now. And so what we were really producing here was a wine for a 37-year-old mom with two kids pushing a cart through a, a big supermarket looking for a staple wine that tasted the same from year to year that was varietally correct. And that was completely different than the uh, vineyard designated Appalachian wines uh, that were, the, the, you know, that were all the rage. And all, most of the buyers in those days were male. And most of the buyers of wines over $20 were males. But they were overlooking this huge market. You know, 78% of the shoppers in the supermarkets were women. The guy says, what's for dinner, honey? What he's really saying is here, Take the wallet, take the credit cards, you make the brand decisions, you fill up five bags with groceries in a half hour, come home, put them away, fix me dinner and tell me what's for dinner. So he surrendered his decision-making power right then. And we saw this, we saw that this whole market, which was basically a female market, was not being addressed with the idea of consistent, dependable, flavored tasting wines that had a profile that she could depend on. Because if we said, oh, I'm sorry, uh, this vintage is a little chalky, you know, the elephants got loose in the vineyard this year, she's just <laughs> going to say, I'm sorry, it tastes funny, and that would be the end of it. Right, right. So, yeah. And, and when you say consistency, one of the other things you're just inferring, there are two things you're inferring. One is delicious uh, or yummy. 
Uh, yeah. And and actually, um, wine that you're willing to have an ongoing relationship with. You're very happy to have this wine in your world. So That's in the right. meantime, let's fast forward through the 90s when the big wines out of California started really making some, they started in the 70s, but they really started to come into their own as we, as a wine sipping culture, embraced the notion of wine at our table the way other cultures did around the world. And all of a sudden the industry grows and everybody's paying attention to the fact that now there are wines everywhere, including our supermarkets, bridging that moment from, do you drink wine to what wine do you enjoy? Right. Not do you drink wine, but which can I serve you? Because it's already been adopted. Talk about that transition and how you rode that transition. Well, the transition was tough for us because we were pioneers. And, you know, the people who were in the wine industry um, and, and the various different groups in the wine industry, they kind of shunned us. They said, well, you guys are cheapening wine, you know. Uh, and what you're doing is a novelty and it, it won't last. And, uh, you know, how dare you uh, put a blend in the bottle that tastes the same from year to year? You know, wine should be vintage. So there was this, this was going on. But then fast forward five years, they were calling us up from their tasting rooms and saying, you know, we just wanted to tell you that we have about 10 people in the tasting room right now that got started on Barefoot and that's their regular house wine. But because they now know wine at all, they're in our tasting room buying $45 bottles of wine. So, so, so we feel like we helped. Let's, let's, let's talk through, cause we've got, a, you're very generous to be with us today and I don't wanna waste a moment of our time together. Talk through in a, a minute or so, if you would, what happens when someone discovers wine? Well, I think that in order to discover wine, uh, people have to discover wine at a price point that they can afford. They're not going to go out and discover a $27 a bottle of uh, Zinfandel. They might go to discover a $10 bottle of Zinfandel. So, so that's number one. Number two is once we get past the price point, it has to be soft and palatable because these are generally folks who are not used to some of the refinements of the drier varietals. And so it wants to be big fruit. It wants to be easy on the palate. It wants to be easy drinking. It wants to be full bodied and it wants to be true to varietal character. So those were the kinds of principles that we used to, to make barefoot wines. That's what Jennifer did. And she became very good at this. She won more, more awards than any other winemaker. We were just amazed. So we were blessed to have somebody. And what's interesting is our, our market was mostly female because that's where the money was. And guess what? She was a female winemaker. A brilliant female winemaker. This year in 2020 for the Proof Awards, the judges selected... Jonathan, do we have the image of the Century Award winner, 100 point perfect score for the proof awards for the barefoot? Um, have you got it there? There it is. Uh, 100 points, a perfect score. Michael, I'm going to say congratulations. And I want to explain that, in fact, you sold the company to, to, to the Gallows. Um, but let's put that back up. This is, it's impossible to overstate how satisfied and surprised the judges were in sipping this wine. There were lots of wines entered in this competition. And this says so many things, including congratulations. Um, let's talk about what this wine actually is and why this 100 points might surprise people who are used to seeing the 100-point winners on the cover of Wine Spectator magazine and not necessarily putting it together with a brand commonly found at grocery stores called Barefoot. People love this wine, but maybe they don't understand how it goes together the way that it does. Uh, please talk a little bit about, about what that 100-point means. Well, first of all, like I said, I can only take a bow for hiring Jennifer Wall. Um, 
And but I can't really take a bow for winning the hundred points. I am absolutely astounded to see any wine with a hundred points. And I am gratified that it was a brand that I created. I can tell you that uh, that Jennifer uh, tends to want to present wines that are soft and velvety, uh, you know, just enough acid to provide backbone, but not so much that it's going to take the enamel off your teeth, as I like to say, uh, and uh, or burn your throat. Uh, and a true fruit, you know, big berries, right? Uh, but, uh, you know, basically it's easy, It's the idea of easy drinking wine. You know, that's, that's the concept behind Barefoot. Now, part of the reason people were so surprised by this 100-point score was the price point associated with that bottle. Would you talk a little bit about where Barefoot is in the marketplace price-wise? Okay, so when we created Barefoot, you know, we weren't from the wine industry, but we did have some business background. So we went to the stores to discover where the velocity price point was. Now, velocity price point, that means that's the price at which most things in that category sell. If I said cameras to you, you'd say $200. If I said bicycles, you'd say $600. Where do you come up with these numbers? It's because it's the popular number for that particular thing. So for, for these wines today, it's like $699 to $999 is what you're talking about. So uh, under Essentially $10. under $10, widely, everywhere, under 10 bucks. That's right. And that's not easy to do because – you have to start with the shelf price and then you have to work backwards. Now the glass corks and foils are going to be the same for an expensive bottle of wine as for an inexpensive right. bottle of wine. So that's a big solid cost you got right there. Um, and you know, you have to, you have to achieve efficiencies of scale in order to be able to maintain this price point. And that's the beauty of barefoot is we started large and we got larger. And I think that what E and J has done with the brand right now is really created a volume that enables them to present this wonderful product to the general public at such an affordable price that they can afford to buy it every week. You know, it can be their own personal house wine. So, so you've got volume and you've got velocity. That's right. Volume and velocity. And believe me, it's not easy to get started like that. No. And and that really turns out to be the formula for the ultimate success. <laughs> right. You have to you have to bet on the future. You have to say, I believe that this is going to be very popular. And uh, you know, you also have to kind of hold your belt really tight and be undercapitalized for like the first four or five years until you achieve that market share. Um, we didn't even it went under our watch, we only really started to get big in the year two, in like uh, 2000. And by 2003, 2004, we were in all 50 states. We were in thousands of supermarkets. We were in 28 foreign countries. This begs the question, and we now know the answer, but how do you produce that much wine? <laughs> well, you know, I'm it's sure- It's a staggering number at this point. You know, it's, it's, it is staggering. Um, like I said, the way we got started was we traded for debt and the debt was $300,000. So you take the $300,000 and you convert that into wine bottles and you wind up with uh, 18,000 bottles. Wow. Well, that, I mean, 18,000 cases. So that's times 12. So that's a lot of bottles. So now you have to sell that in order just to break even. So what we did is we started to look at the business and we said, you know, the most important thing is quality control and sales and accounting. Because if you're making a mistake in your business and you don't know it for two months, it's too late. So you have to stay on top of the numbers. So you have to know if the stores have it or if they don't have it or, you know, what the problems are in distribution. And I would say that Barefoot's, real success was understanding and uh, and managing the distribution system. 
so that we could put a bottle of Barefoot in Tallahassee, Florida. So we could put a bottle of Barefoot in New York City and we could keep it there. It wouldn't run out. It wouldn't go away. It would stay there. And Let me tell you, I'm going to tell the audience. I'm going to share it with you. I'll say to anybody, there isn't a circumstance under which you would be disappointed to have this wine poured in your glass. If you were dining, if you were looking at art, if you were visiting with friends, this is a really surprising, delicious, accessible, consistently delicious, wonderful bottle of wine from the judges, from the buyers, from everybody that was involved in this year's Proof Awards. This really was an eye-opening experience. For the money, it just proves there really isn't, for that money, no place any better that you could go and pour something even comparable. This is really in a league of its own. And so for that, we wanted to say congratulations. It's the Barefoot Sellers, again, widely available. And it was, can we put the, the shot back up there, Jonathan? I mean, that to me is uh, just a testament to everything about the success of a dream. Michael Houlihan, you were the one who dreamed that dream. You made it come to life. Uh, and now today, um, there it is. It is widely available. It's under $10. It's an eminently food-friendly wine. I have to ask, in a room like that, in which you sit right now, your great room, where you entertain your distributors and your guests, your friends and your family, what is the house toast that you share over a glass of Barefoot Cellars? That delicious. It's, uh, uh, here's to a more optimistic view of the future. Cling. Especially, especially in these COVID times. Yeah. I look forward to um, clinking our glasses in person together sometime soon. And again, congratulations on the Century Award. When you take a sip of this wine, I will tell you, race ipsa loquitur, the thing speaks for itself. It is a hundred point sip. And it's so delicious and accessible that you will be hard pressed not to make it your own house pour. Anyway, thank you for making that possible. Thank you for making time to be with us. And really, again, congratulations. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Need a push getting your emerging spirits, wine, or beverage brand into the hands of consumers? Interested in winning a double gold award? Proof Awards, the ultimate beverage competition where all judges are beverage buyers, can jumpstart your campaign. Enter the Proof Awards. It's time to get your spirits, wines, and cocktail mixers the attention they deserve. Take advantage of the Proof Awards exposure and marketing program with Food and Beverage Magazine. It's all about putting your bottle into the right hands. Your brands will be tasted and rated by judges that are all beverage buyers for bars, nightclubs, resorts, casinos, liquor stores, big box retail, and many beverage distributors from across the U.S. Enter your spirits, wine, or beverage brand today. Hundreds of categories to choose from. One simple way to sign up. Visit www.proofawards.com. That's www.proofawards.com. And follow the enter portal into our competition. Whether you are thinking about becoming a restaurateur or you are already in the business, Michael Politz has written a must read The Food and Beverage Magazine's Guide to Restaurant Success. Pick up your copy today at Barnes & Noble, Amazon, Books A Million, or wherever fine books are sold.